reading from uh, the book of Jonah. And the reading is um, from Jonah 1 verse 4 uh, down to um, chapter 2. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea and there was a great storm on the sea. So the, the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God and threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it. But Jonah had gone below in the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him saying, how is it that you are sleeping? Get up and call your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that, you, so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots, so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. <clears throat> so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. So they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rode desperately to return to the land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Thanks, Amen. Amen. I pray with you, brother. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we ask a blessing upon Paul now that he, uh, he receives your Holy Spirit to give him the words that need to be spoken today. Mm. Father, bless him. Let us hear the words from you, Lord, this morning. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Wonderful. All right. So we began our series last week. So session one was last week. Today is session two. Uh, I'm not sure if there's going to be a session three in chapter one or not, but uh, we're going to find out by the end of the service. So, um, so just look around at uh, people and look around. And uh, just, just, just see uh, what God does uh, when we let him. We see smiley, wonderful faces who uh, have been touched by the presence of God. And, uh, you know, the Christian fellowship, the Christian together is, uh, is a gift to the world. An absolute gift to the world. And uh, we need to bear that in mind uh, when we're tempted to um, sabotage others uh, because they don't look like us or agree with us or yeah. think like us or yeah. act like us. We need to be mindful that unity in the church is precious to God. Yeah. It's also precious in the family too. Yeah. Um, but the relationship with the church and with the family starts with the individual becoming, uh, being in a relationship with God mm -hmm. and a relationship that really is affecting uh, their lives. And uh, today's uh, word really is... Um, reflective of, of a man who tries to run away from the call of God. So, I said, I finished off last week by saying, and, and uh, Jonah ended up, uh, as it were, down a hole. Uh, Jonah, he went down. He went down a hole. If you want to connect to God, you always have to go up. Uh, God is always up. He's never down. 
And uh, so if you want to connect to God, you have to go up. You have to look up. You have to see more. If you want to see God, you have to see on the horizon. You have to look up to see God. And uh, there are many references in Scripture that will encourage us to look up. But Jonah, he went down. And you know, the reality of going down is to go down, down. Mm -hmm. And when you go down, down, what happens is the reality of you, who you are, your whole well-being, your countenance uh, be becomes weak and frail and vulnerable. And uh, we often use the term in, in medicine, not that, I'm a, not that I'm a doctor because uh, I'm definitely not, um, but uh, my two children are. But, but my, um, and so, so we, we, they're run down. You never say they're run up. <laughs> and Jonah's gone down. And that's what happens when you turn away or run away from God. Into the stern of the ship is where he went. And that's basically into the deep, dark hole. Into the deep, dark hole. So Jonah is seeking to escape from the presence of the Lord. But think about it. How can you think of escaping from the presence of God? Really? Where can you go? He's omnipresent. Where can you go? You can't go anywhere without God being there first. You can't hide anywhere. The only place that God isn't is in hell. He doesn't live there. And that's why it's so dark. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so bad. And that's why it's so broken. And that's why it's where the wicked are going. And God had initiated in Jonah a desire to speak to Nineveh in order to be able to give them an opportunity to undo the wickedness that has come upon them in that land. So see the picture. He's running away from the call of God. But you can't really, where can you hide from God? So which Lord is Jonah running away from? There, there are many Lords. We had a meal, we had a meal on Friday night, and I uh, said to the waiter, you know, he's smiley, we called him. He had a big smiley face. And I said, I said to him uh, something about the Bible, and he mentioned something. And I asked him if he was a, what, what religion he was, and he told me he was a Muslim. And I said, oh, our, our Bible, the first five books of the Bible, they're very similar, really. You know, they've got a connection. You know. It's good to make connection with people that don't yet. Yeah. And he said, oh yeah, that's right, you know, we, and, it, and he's, we began to talk. But it's, it's, um, he started to tell me about um, his God. They call him Allah. But which Lord is Jonah running away from? Which God is Jonah running away from? It's the only Lord that can control nature. Mm -hmm. He's the only Lord that can make the sea do exactly what he wants the sea to do for him. When the Lord speaks, he can do anything at all. And God wants us to raise our expectations with regards to what he can do for his world, but also for you too. And sometimes we've allowed ourselves to look down instead of looking up. And as a result of that, our expectations have diminished because of disappointment. But we need to be those in these days that start to look up the mountain of God again and take our eyes off of the ground. So, God, so, so Jonah is running away from the only law that can make a difference. In 1 Samuel chapter uh, 6, there's a story. The ark had been stolen from the, from the Philistines. And the byproduct of, of that was having stolen the ark and taken it into their land. They began to develop tumours. Now these tumours were killing the people. And as a result of that, many died. And so they changed from village and town and village and town. And wherever the ark of God that was stolen from Israel went, tumours developed on people. Because the ark was a midst an unholy people, and it was creating a problem for the people. And so as a result of that, the Philistines decided that what they would do is they would send it, the ark back to, the, to Israel. But they didn't just want to send it back because they didn't really, really, really know that it was God that was actually doing it. So what they did was they basically got a new cart, made it up, put the ark on the cart, they put some gold things in the ark to make it look like it was a gift back to them. And they 
they, they took two cows that had just recently produced babies, calves, and they put the calves in the shed and they tied the cows to the car and they let the cart go independently and they watched to see where it would go and it got to the fork of the road and it went to the land where the people of God was and they followed it all the way through to the land now everything inside those cows instinctively would have been desiring mm. to feed their baby calves and all the cry and there was a word that was used it was called um, lowing mm. uh, I asked Clive the other day and he said it's not I called it lowing because L.S. Lowry, see, I like pictures. So I said Lowry. And he said, no, it's, it's lowing. Mm. And, uh, and the cows were lowing. And I said, no, don't low, they moo. <laughs> I never heard a cow lowing. <laughs> Mooing. And, and, he, he, and, and so the cows were, were, were and they went back, to, and the, 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 the Philistines saw that it was God that had allowed these two. And so they saw. Now, God can speak to a cow. And make a cow leave its children and go to the land of it. He is the Lord that Jonah is running away from. The Lord who sent the wind to move the sea, to stop the boat taking Jonah away from Nineveh, heading down to Tarshish. He sent the wind to move the sea. The Lord hurled, the Bible says, the Lord hurled the wind. It was like... And he threw the wind at the sea and made the sea move in such a way that the, that the ship that Jonas was on began to break up in the harbour. The wind just caused the ship to break up by this strong wind and rough sea. And Jonah's safety and his escape route was beginning to diminish. Now the sailors, they're afraid. Now, I don't know if you've ever been out on sea when it's rough. There's a few nodding faces. Well, I've been out one or two seas when it's been rough. And, uh, you know, a little bit rough. And I don't like a little bit rough. And I remember our boys used to go out on our boat and they would just go through the waves like that. And I would say, no, slow down, Rich, slow down, Rich. And Josh, stop it, you know, and they were reckless, they just went through the waves. And uh, I didn't like the waves, and the, I like nice and calm. And God had caused this storm to rise up in the sea, and as a result of that, the ship was breaking up, and the sailors, it says, became frightened. Now, when you see sailors frightened, yeah. you really need to know that that's a, that's a, we're in a dangerous sea. Yeah. When we was out one day on holiday at sea, watching whales or um, something, the dolphins, and uh, they was all jumping up and down and everything, and the sea was really rough, and I just kept my eye, not on the dolphins, I kept my eye on the captain, just in case he, he started panicking. Because if he was going to panic, I was going to start panicking. Because I just knew what would happen. He, I thought, he knows the sea, and as long as he's all right, I'm all right. And Debbie was sitting there gripped with me, you know, she was the same. And the kids were sort of leaning over and trying to feed the dolphins. And, but the sailors, they were frightened, because the sea was going to take their lives. So they cry out to their gods. Which Lord? To their gods. Which Lord? To their gods. Not the God who commands the sea or moves cows or, or sends the wind. No, just to anything that's out there. Anything that might be interested in listening to this desperation of prayer. They cried out to their gods, any gods. Desperation will do that to us all. I remember hearing about an aeroplane that was going down in the sky. In, in the sky, a big Boeing, something or other, it was going down, and, the, and there was a, rec, a recording on there, and they heard all the people screaming and crying out to God. The, the plane crashed and everyone died. And desperation will do that when you're going down. Desperation will do that. It will make you cry out. Because there is a God-shaped gap in the heart of us, Billy Graham used to say. A God-shaped gap in the heart of us. And when we're really desperate, we cry out to God. It doesn't matter how hard or how hostile we've been during our lives, how much we've ignored God. When we're really desperate, that's when we cry out to God. 
Desperation will make you fix your eyes, brothers and sisters, on the problem, not the solution. It'll make us look at the wind, the waves. It'll make us, when we're desperate, we just see the problem. But people of faith, they don't go down, they look up. And they see the solution. A bit like Colonel Custard, Custer. And, he, and, he, uh, 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 you know, and he came over the hill. And he began to save the army under attack from the Indians. People of faith, they look up. They don't look down. I wonder... Who do you go to in your desperations? Who do you cry out to? Where do you go to in your great need? Is God your sanctuary? Or do you have something else, a just in case? <coughs> Trust God, but just in case God doesn't turn up, you've got a substitute. God is looking for a people of faith who will put their trust in him, in all of their hearts and all of their minds. Now Debbie told us about Carl two weeks ago when we came home from London, having had uh, tea at the Buckingham Palace. Not, not we, we didn't actually see the Queen, sadly, uh, but uh, we had tea at Buckingham Palace in the gardens. And um, it was very nice. There was about a thousand people out there, but we you know it was, it was good. And um, when we came home, uh, we went in, 10 o'clock, went in, and we heard nothing. And then 20 minutes later, Jessica turned up, uh, um, Rosie turned up, and uh, she heard Carl crying, he lives opposite us, she heard him crying, calling out, help, help, help. She came running in, she got me, we went out there, and we began to serve him in his predicament. And while we were waiting for the ambulance, Carl was there, he couldn't move, he said, he couldn't move, he was in pain. I, pray, I said, Carl, I pray for you, I prayed. And I prayed these words, Carl's, that Carl's spirit would rise up in him and take charge of everything he is. I prayed that God would bring his rest and his peace into everything Carl is. I prayed that God's presence would fill Carl in his soul and in his body, his mind, emotions and his will. He couldn't do anything about his body. His body was just there laying, waiting for the ambulance to take him away. But we could do a whole lot about who Carl is in his body. Because you are not just your physiological. Right. You are spiritual beings. You have souls yeah. and you live in bodies. Yeah. And one day the body is going to come to an end. Yeah. And as a result of that, we won't be here anymore. We'll be there. And so the reality of who we are, in terms of who we are, is the eternal reality of our identity. Mm -hmm. Spirit, soul, beings, living in bodies. And God, I believe, moved in Carl and gave him peace. And soon the ambulance came and began to minister to his body. The sailors' attempt to save themselves was to throw the cargo into the sea to lighten the load. And our best efforts may well be an attempt to release us from the bondages that we find ourselves in in life. But our best efforts will not deliver us. They may well suppress, they may well distract, they may well nullify, they may well delay, but they won't deliver us. Only God is the one who can deliver us. Amen. The God of Jonah. The God who is able to make the sea move and the wind blow. He is the God that Jonah was running away from. He had fallen into a deep, dark hole, into the stern of the ship. And that's what happens when you flee from the presence of the Lord. He had fallen down a hole. What about you? Have you known the experience of falling down a hole? Are you in one right now? Have I captured you at an opportune moment? God wants to be your deliverer and he wants you to take 
hold of your life so that he can take hold of you. God wants Christians, brothers and sisters, to live on the King's Highway. Now the King's Highway is a straight road. It's a wide road. It's the best road. And God wants us to live on the King's Highway so that we live like Jesus lived. That we follow him on the King's Highway. That we, as I said before, we stay living in alignment. We live in alignment with God. When we are tempted to go astray and succumb to temptation and give ourselves to inappropriate, and we get out of alignment of God's ways, or when we get out of love, and getting out of love basically is doing what God wouldn't do, and being what God wouldn't be, and saying what God wouldn't say, and going where God wouldn't go. Getting out of love is getting out of alignment. And God wants us to live on the King's Highway so that we are in line, that we are in love, and that we're walking the King's Way, the King's Highway. God wants Christians to live on the King's Highway. As we let him write his laws and his ways upon our hearts. God wants to write his laws and his ways upon our hearts. Now Jonah, in this storm, sea raging, wind blowing, sailors praying, is down in the hole, taking a rest. Taking a rest. He's laying down and resting again in the hole. When God first called him, he was resting. And he said to him, Jonah, get up. And here he is again, resting in the hole of a ship. Even though all this chaos is going on around him. He's in the hole of the ship, resting. There is a resident weariness that comes upon you when you're out of the will of God. A resident weariness that comes on you when you're out of the presence of God. When you're outside of the will of the Lord, or when you're running away from the presence of the Lord. A deep, soulish depression that makes you feel very tired. Weary tired. Deep, weary tired. And Jonah had fell into a deep sleep, in a deep hole. And there is a sleep, brothers and sisters, that brings refreshment. And that's the gift of God. A sleep that brings refreshment. But in this situation, Jonah is asleep and his sleep is bringing no such refreshment. There is a sleep that never refreshes you, no matter how much you sleep. The captain said to Jonah, Get up. At least try and do something. Call on your God. He might, if he's there, show concern for us. Unlike you, Jonah, we care about our lives. We don't want to perish. We don't want to die. Perishing is when your body no longer fits, is fit for purpose. And we die. And our spirit and our soul leave our body. Because we can't stay here anymore as our body doesn't work. Now, the superstition of the sailors gets the better of them. And they begin to draw lots. And drawing lots is a form of divination. It's an attempt to find out what the eternal spirit realm is doing. What's going on in that spirit realm? And bringing what's going on in that spirit realm 
into the carnal realm, into this world, into the reality of what we know. Talking to spirits is an offence to God and is a very dangerous thing to do. Yeah. It will invite demons into your soul, your mind, your emotions and your will. The sailors were acknowledging that the spirit world lives alongside the carnal world. And this spirit world has power to influence the carnal world. They are attempting to identify the perpetrator of this catastrophe. They put their faith in the lots for guidance to do it. They want to identify who's to blame. Why are we so eager to blame? Why are we always looking to find out whose fault it is? Why are we ready to pass judgment on others? The better question to ask is, how do we solve the problem? Yeah. So the lot fell on Jonah. And they asked him to justify himself to them. And they say, who, what, where, who, what? <laughs> who, what, where, who, what? <laughs> Meaning, whose fault is it? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? Who are your people? What is your country? And they pressed Jonah. And Jonah's response to the sailors is to give them both barrels. And he says, I am a Hebrew. So he was saying, Yahweh is our God. I am a Hebrew. And I feel the Lord God of heaven. So he knows who, which Lord he's running away from. I fear the Lord God of heaven. And what does he say? He puts this declarational caveat. He says, he who made the sea and the dry land. Now all the sailors want to do is get on dry land at this present time. And he says, I serve the God who made the sea and the dry land. He knows who it is whom he serves. This declaration filled the sailors with fear. And fear is always a part of consulting the spirit realm. Whenever you involve yourself in anything that is not connected to God in the spirit realm, you are opening up yourself to fear manipulating your life from that point onwards. Fear brings about destruction. It takes away our courage. But there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. Amen. As a result of the loss falling on Jonah, the sailors identify the perpetrator of this catastrophe. Why had Jonah not obeyed God's instructions to go to Nineveh? Now this really is the big question in all of the four chapters actually. Why don't people obey God? Jonah explains that he's running away from the presence of God. Why do people do this? Why would you run away from someone who wants your very best? Why would you live and travel your life on a bumpy uh, back street road when you can live on the king's highway? Most of the world is living on bumpy back street roads. And Christians are supposed to be living on the King's Highway, revealing the revelation of the Father to the world. But Jonah says, I'm running away from the presence of God. They, went, they want to know from, uh, from Jonah what will make things right again. And the world is looking to find out what will make things right again again and Christians are supposed to have the answer to what will make things right again and we need to be available to them to present to them what will make things right again now in this situation Jonah presents himself in this way he says the solution will require a sacrifice solution will require a sacrifice they want to know from Jonah what will make things right again. And he says the solution is for a sacrifice. After all, jo the, the, the sailors, they know that God is angry with Jonah, not with them. And you know, sometimes our rebellion, our rebellion draws other people into judgment. Our behaviour 
draws others into judgment. Many suffer at the wrongdoing of others every day because some have given themselves over to behaviour. And the sailors want to know what will bring a solution to this problem. And Jonah says, a sacrifice will be required. Jonah's solution is to offer himself to the sailors and says to them, throw me into the sea. Jesus used Jonah's experience as evidence to verify he was who the people said he was. So when they asked him, who do people say I am? He revealed to the people and said to them, I want no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. He used Jonah as an affirmation, an authentication of who he was. Some say that Jonah, the story of Jonah is not true. It's not a real event. It's a myth. It's a fable. But there is too much detail in the story of, of Jonah to conclude that it's a myth. Dates, places, families, father's name, occupation. They all demonstrate that this is far from a myth, far from a fable. So whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? Well, there I'm going to stop and carry on next week. So, Rob, do you want to come up? Same time next week. Yeah. Same, 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 yeah. same God time, same God channel. Same God channel, come along. Wonderful, thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. worth a yeah. round of applause, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Praise God, praise God. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, yeah, Paul asked me to come up and, and, and close with a prayer, but I was so. Um, Kind of, hello Zoom, I wanted to say hello Zoomers as well, by the way. I don't know which one I'm supposed to look at, but, but just wanted to embrace the Zoomers. And, um, and I just got Psalm 139, I mean, unsurprisingly, based on what Paul's been saying. So rather than say a prayer, I just want to read out Psalm 139 um, over us today. It says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for, for, for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to me. How precious are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. Over to Paul to close. If um, any of the things, the things I've said this morning have stirred stuff in you that you think, maybe we just need to talk about that, pray about that, just work something through, feel free to come to me and uh, we can uh, 
we can minister today. Uh, uh, or um, you, know, you can call me and we can work out a way in which we can minister into that situation that you have by way of a prompted need to deliver you from that problem. Have a great week. Uh, enjoy it. And uh, bye. <laughs>